All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 9 through 20. Paul says this. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, that he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross." Um, Would you pray with me? This is a prayer of John Calvin. Grant, Almighty God, that as we have not only been created by Thee, but when Thou hast placed us in this world, Thou hast also enriched us with abundance of all blessings. O grant that we may not transfer to others the glory due to Thee, and that especially since we are daily admonished by Thy Word and even severely reproved, we may not with an iron hardness resist, but render ourselves pliable to thee, and not give ourselves up to our own devices, but follow with true docility and meekness that rule which thou hast prescribed in thy word, until at length, having put off all the remains of errors, we shall enjoy that blessed light which thou hast prepared for us in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. Um, This week is our second look at the Reformation slogan, Sola Gratia, by Grace Alone, um, the first exposition of which our own Dr. McLaughlin gave so ably. Um, What can I add to an excellent sermon such as that on the topic? Uh, Not much, but um, part of my aim today is to show how the Protestant doctrine justification occurring by grace alone is first and foremost, just like the doctrine of justification is. It's firstly a statement, not about us sinners, but about the God who is for us in Jesus Christ. And secondly, it's my aim to demonstrate how that slogan, sola gratia, that reality, relates to two other major points in the system of Christian doctrine. Um, The doctrine of creation, the doctrine of election. And while it is absolutely the case, as Chancellor Piper said that by grace alone is a statement about the nature of justification. Um, By grace alone is also a fitting way for God to deal with his creatures in that it is harmonious with, uh, consistent with the way in which God's works other than justification come to us. Um, In other words, it makes sense that salvation is like this because God and his other works are like so. So that's where we're going today. Um, The force of the slogan, by grace alone, is that at no point in the event of humans being saved from sin and its consequences, does human merit provide any grounds for such a salvation. Um, Not even human obedience, that's the fruit of regeneration, the indwelling spirit does that. Um, All saving work is attributed to God in Christ alone. Um, As Professor McLaughlin put it, this grace is, quote, God's unmerited and particular saving work for us in Christ Jesus. Our salvation in Christ is all of God's grace and God's grace alone. Um, But it's also a description of what must be the case 
given the biblical description of our human plight. Uh, we are dead in trespasses and sins, Paul tells us. Um, in other words, grace alone is a sort of theological condensation of biblical teaching. It's, it's an incredibly dense, thoroughgoing way of answering the human questions, why is anyone at all saved? Um, how can any of us have hope in the face of death? Um, those are crucial existential questions that all of us face. Um, but rather today than put the emphasis on grace alone or grace alone, we're going to take a step back and remember that this is God's grace alone. And we can't move past who is the actor of this great act in the drama, simply to focus on the benefits that we receive. Um, the benefits themselves of the gospel have their ground in the identity and the nature of the one trying God who enacts this great saving work. Um, the historical point here, given October 25th, 2017, is that the Reformation, as you know, is, rough, you know, is largely about a handful of theological and practical issues. Um, of primary importance is doctrine of justification, the nature and interpretation of scripture, ecclesial authority and polity. But when it came to the biggest, most important doctrine of all in Christian theology, the doctrine of God, um, the Reformation is little different from the medieval and patristic doctrine that they inherited. Um, there's a whole lot of continuity there that we usually don't acknowledge. So the Reformation, in its best moments, argues for a doctrine of God that has its roots back in Augustine and the Cappadocians, Anselm and Thomas Aquinas. It's not invented there in the 16th century in Geneva. And Protestant soteriology, our doctrine of salvation, seems to me, is much more consistent with that classical traditional doctrine of God than, let's say, Rome's is. So, um, as an example of that, the first of the 39 articles of the Anglican Communion can serve as sort of representative of other Reformation confessions and theologies. It says this about God, quote, there is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body, parts, or passions, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible, and in the unity of this Godhead there be three persons, of one substance, power, and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And all of that, especially the nod to divine simplicity, that God is without body, parts, or passions, um, that's an inheritance from the patristic and medieval tradition. And so, it's reformational as well. Um, the way that the church has often reasoned about the identity and the nature of God is um, backwards, or maybe a better term is upwards. You start in the narrative of the economy of salvation that we see in the Gospels, in Jesus, and then we reason about the inner life of God. Colossians 1 gives us a lot of material to do just that. So if you look at verse 13, verse 14, with Paul we give thanks to God, because we've experienced those wonderful benefits of the gospel. By God the Father, we have been delivered from the domain of darkness, and he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, and it is in this son that we have redemption, which is the forgiveness of sins. This benefit, this gospel is ours as a share of the saint's great inheritance, and to take part in that, for anyone to be fit to share in that, we're only qualified by God's grace alone. The Father does that. He qualifies us in Jesus Christ. We do not merit that inheritance ourselves. So far, so good. And yet, um, the apostle here, Paul, journeys, as it were, further up and further in. He says more. Um, Jesus is fully man. He shares our flesh and our bones. Um, it's only because of that that he is the one mediator between God and man. It is because of his being the last Adam that we can be baptized into his death and united in a resurrection like his. In Colossians here, it's by the son's body of flesh that somehow, unbelievably, we enemies of God have been reconciled to, to him. In other words, we were dead in our sins, 
but God made us alive together with Christ, having forgiven all of our trespasses, the text says. These debts we owed to God because of our sins, sins of commission, sins of omission, and these God set aside when the son was nailed to the cross. And yet, that's not all. Paul wants us to see that this son who is our redeemer is not only our head, our representative, like us in every way yet without sin, but also that the son is wholly unique, that our salvation can be only because the son has incommunicable relation to the God the Father. He is the only one who is the image of the invisible God, the one in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and in whom the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. It is, in, it is he, not us, who is the firstborn of all creation, and by whom all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. It is in him, in the Son, not in us, that all things hold together. In Christ alone, in this unique sense, he is God's beloved Son. And because of this, because Jesus is this one, then we can be saved from sin and death. Um, as the New Testament reveals, the eternal depth of our salvation is by grace alone is in this unique relation between Father and Son. And that relation has traditionally been labeled with a technical term, right? Eternal generation, the eternal begetting of the Son. Um, how has the church made that move? How have we moved from gospel salvation to doctrine of the Trinity? Well, they've, they've reasoned upwards. They've concluded that, this little rule, that the divine missions follow the divine processions. Uh, all that means merely is that what we see God doing in Jesus to save us from our sins tells us something true about God's inner being, who he is. Um, the economy is like this, therefore theology is like that. Colossians 1, Philippians 2, the Gospel of John, Hebrews, Revelation, the entirety of the New Testament actually, they declare that Christ is uniquely related to God such that he is fully God, yet not identical to God the Father. How can we say that? Well, the church has, in order to say that well, developed a distinction between divine essence and the divine persons, right? One God, one divine essence in three divine persons. And they do it by doing what Augustine did. They look at passages like John 5:26. Jesus can bring dead life, or Jesus can bring life to us dead sinners because not only does he do things in his earth, earthly ministry, but because as the Father has life in himself, so also he's granted to the Son to have life in himself. Second, we conclude that then Father and Son are not two separate substances, not two different things. Because if so, then the Son isn't fully God, and he can't save us, and we are not to worship him. Since God alone is he who can forgive sin and give life, and so we conclude that those names, Father and Son, are relationship-wise terms. They tell us a relation between the two of them. They're related to one another in a personal distinction, and there's not any other distinction to be drawn between Father and Son. God is Father, God is Son, and they are not identical. Um, is, is God the Father the part of God that is holy? And is, is God the Son the part of God that is loving? Or did the Son at some time start to be God? And if so, did this coming to be God make God more perfect or less perfect than he was before? Because we can't answer in the affirmative to any of those things, we have to make the distinction like this. We have to say, Jesus the Son is fully God, and the relation between Father and Son is, that is so important in the work of redemption in Jesus Christ, that is rooted back in God's eternally perfect relation to himself, the Father eternally begetting the Son, um, what we call eternal generation trying to tie together gospel 
and theology proper as best we can. The Son, incarnate in Jesus Christ, our Savior, He is the fullness of deity. He is God in the infinite fullness of all of God's good, glorious, loving, holy, merciful, just, impassable, immutable, true, wrathful, gentle, peaceful being. All of those attributes they share together as Father and Son. Both Father and Son are without beginning, without external cause, and with the Spirit are the one perfect God who has always been life, whose life has always been full, who's always been without need, without lack. The Son and the Spirit, therefore, were sent on mission so that you, so that we, can be saved. And when they are, it's not merely that they reveal that God is three in one, triune. It's by, they, they save us by revealing God's perfect triune life. Um, if this is the agent of our salvation, guys, if, this, if it is this eternally perfect Son who redeems us from sin, then it makes perfect sense that salvation is by grace alone and not grounded upon any merits of our own. For the staggering act of saving sinners from hell, this God will not give his glory to another. The Reformation slogan, grace alone, is not just the most exegetically accurate description of what the Bible says about our salvation, but it's the most fitting, the most harmonious theological conclusion we can draw if God is like that. The doctrine of God's triune perfection and the doctrine of salvation by grace alone are complementary. Okay, so, so far, the doctrine of God. What of other doctrines? Um, well, we didn't really answer our question fully up front, right? Um, why is anyone saved? It, that, that's not really answered if I say, because God is perfect and his Father, Son, and Spirit needs nothing. Right? There's a whole lot of stuff in there that we have to make clear. Otherwise, it's a bit confusing, and some of the glory of the gospel is, is dimmed. So the first question we ought to ask, I think, should be, why is anyone? Um, why does anyone exist at all? We always simply assume our own existence, right, as human beings. We like to think that we and the world around us simply are, and then we can easily slide into the position of us having a, a freestanding claim over against God, like we're two equal partners in this whole thing. Um, and we get to have arguments about him, or with him about stuff in the world that we don't understand based on that. But part of what God gives us in the Bible is, I think, training to stop doing that so that we reason well about ourselves, but also we need to ask that question and always keep it in our mind so that we rightly glorify Father, Son, and Spirit, who is our creator. Revelation 4 is that picture of the four living creatures and the elders singing in eternity the fact that God is glorious because he's made everything, and we want to do that as well as we can as well. The Lord is to be worshiped and glorified, and idols are to be abhorred because God is the maker of heaven and earth. We were not there when he laid the foundation of the earth. We were not the one who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang for joy. Just as we have no claim upon God for our salvation, but it's by grace alone, likewise we have no claim upon God for our existence, for our creation. We could say creation is by gift alone. Or in the tr church's more traditional language, creation's ex nihilo. It is the perfectly free, ineffable, gratuitous, loving act of bestowing life on us who did not exist. Um, in Aquinas' words, creation is the introduction of being entirely, and creation, like salvation, isn't grounded upon human merit of any sort. How could we have earned this? Yes, creation isn't grace per se, right? Biblically, grace is extended to sinners, and before creation, those things don't exist. Um, Instead, we need to say that creation, life in all of its wonderful variety, given its natures and ends by God, creation's gift. The Lord alone is the fountain of life. 
and is, in Paul's words, he who calls into existence things that do not exist. He doesn't have need of any counselor. He fills heaven and earth. All the cattle on a thousand hills are his, and he would not be less perfect, less glorious, if we and the world had never been. So with Paul and with Anselm, we have to ask all the time, what do we have that we did not receive? But we still ask, why did God do this? Why did God make these things? Jonathan Edwards helps us, right? The end for which God created the world is the glory of God. And we need to add really quickly, but not as if he needed anything, not as if he needed to be glorified. He was always glorious. And somehow God's pleasure is not increased from the level of infinitely happy when he makes us and makes the world. Um, He's already that way. And in the same way that we must answer the question of why anyone is saved by ultimately resting on God's loving, kind, gracious will alone, we answer the question about creation with, it pleased God to do so. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps, the psalmist tells us. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He, pleases, he does what he pleases, and what he did was make us. It pleases him to do so. Um, or in Isaac Dorner's words, love is also a lover of life. And therefore, you and your neighbor and the mice in your basement and the little flecks of rust on the boiler down there, you're all the most surprising and superfluous, the most beloved art project that anybody could dream up in the trillion lifetimes. Um, You all, along with the heavens, the sun and the moon, you declare the glory of God insofar as you exist. Um, And God has said to you, good, given you a name, even though, and he said that, even though you are not properly, ultimately, good, he is. You are not God himself and good in the ultimate sense, and yet he still calls us this. God has gifted being to something that is not himself. We should wonder at this every day. Um, As theologian Kate Sonderegger has put it, the cosmos is suffused by the divine presence, his hidden nearness, yet it remains other than God. Almighty God can be the truth of our truths, the goodness of our many goods, and yet the creature remains. That is the mystery and startling uniqueness of creation. We are and we are not God. And exactly here is where the gospel comes in. So look back at Colossians 1 and realize Paul is telling us that creation and Christology, the mission of the Son, are related. Christ isn't just firstborn of all creation. He is firstborn from the dead. The same Christ who is in whom the fullness of God dwells is the Christ who is the head of the body, the church. The same Christ who is the one by whom all things were created in heaven and on earth is the Christ who's, through whose death and resurrection all things, whether on earth or in heaven, are reconciled to God. Your life was gifted to you in creation and then your life was rescued and given back to you by the triune God and the work in the Son and the Spirit, and it's now hidden with Christ in God. Salvation is by grace alone, and creation, existent itself, is by God's gift alone. He will be glorified for both, and he will not give his glory to another. We see exactly that sort of complementarity between creation and salvation in the book book of Isaiah. In chapter 49, Chapter 44, we hear, Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. Why? Because mountains are great. Because the heavens are amazing. Well, yes, but for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. He's going to send his suffering servant for us. Those things go together because God is the actor of both. Um, Or as the way Oliver O'Donovan has has put it, 
precisely because it is a reversal of Adam's decision to die, the resurrection of Christ is a new affirmation of God's first decision that Adam should live. The work of the creator who made Adam, who brought into being an order of things in which humanity has a place, that work is affirmed once and for all by the conclusion of the resurrection. God says yes in both places. Now, seeing the connection between creation and salvation there takes us to one of the key points of Reformation doctrine. But again, this is not um, exclusively Protestant, but has long roots through the first 1,500 years of the church, and that's the doctrine of election. The answer of because of grace alone that the Refor Reformation gave to the question, why is anyone saved, it necessarily includes this. Um, a moment ago, we asked, why did God create? And we answered, for his glory. And we expanded it by saying, because it was God's good pleasure to do so. Um, it was God's good pleasure, his will to create us image bearers and then put us in living, active fellowship with him in the place that he has made for us in the garden. And that's the part of the eternal will, the eternal divine counsel that yields creation. And our sin broke that. Um, sin ended life in its proper sense that way. It brought death, it brought a curse to all of creation such that it's still groaning. It marred God's image in us such that we need it repaired. It affected every part of our being, our body, our mind, and our will, and it broke our fellowship with God such that we were sent out from Eden. Sin ended life in the only way life is to be had for us creatures. Now, thinking like that, connecting the two things, is something that helps us see sin's reality more clearly, right? Sin isn't just mere rule-breaking. Sin is the refusal of these given created natures and ends. Sin is refusal of our fellowship with God. Sin is the refusal of, capital L, life. The empty, lifeless, fake, natures that we've insanely attempted to construct for ourselves, those are broken cisterns that hold no water. In Ezekiel 18, God rhetorically commands us to make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, knowing full well that we can't. And then we can't because none of us are the fountain of life. None of us are God himself. And so the selves that we construct only yield destruction for us. They only yield deadness. We are dead in our sins. An election, then, is God's will unto covenant fellowship with us, such that he gives his people life at creation and then reestablishes that life in redemption. God wills to be with us as our God, such that we see him face to face and be the creatures that he has made us to be. And therefore, God reconciles us to himself by taking up our hopeless cause himself. In Jesus Christ, by grace alone, grounded in no human merit whatsoever, God gives new life to his people who had ruined the first life that he had given. This is the part of God's eternal will, his divine counsel, that yields redemption. And I think it's best explicated in our time left by looking at the Reformed doctrine of the covenant of redemption. What do we mean by that, covenant of redemption? Um, we mean this, that the eternal decision of God to redeem a fallen creation is a Trinitarian decision. It means that the Father wills to share the glorious bliss of the triune life with us, his people. And he does so not only by creating human beings, but by sending his willing son in the power of his spirit to accomplish that redemption for us. The incarnate life, death, and resurrection of the son as our mediator in the power of the Holy Spirit, the son then ascending to the father's right hand and pouring out the spirit at Pentecost. This is the result of that covenant decision. And it's exactly the way that God accomplishes his, his eternal will to redemption. We come to share in this redemption by faith alone, in Christ alone, faith that the Holy Spirit awakens in all of God's elect in the application of redemption. But note that 
this Trinitarian decision that the Reformed call the covenant of redemption is a will to redemption that reestablishes the covenant fellowship between God and man that was established first in creation. That's what O'Donovan means when he says that the resurrection of Christ is a new affirmation of God's first decision that Adam should live. I bring that up because to me, this provides a massive amount of assurance. Assurance is that great Protestant quality that makes so large a difference in our Christian lives rather than the fear and the guilt and the anxiety that other ways of looking at salvation end up in. At the beginning, we asked, why is anyone saved? How can anyone have hope in the face of death? The answer of grace alone is a way of saying, because God wills you to. He wills you to be saved. But what if he stops willing that? What if he changes his mind? Not only does Scripture say that God is not man, that he should lie, or a son of man, that he should change his mind, so his promises that you read are sure, but in these doctrines here, we see that the certainty of our salvation is tied to God's very being. So, run through them again with me. First, the covenant of redemption is God's Trinitarian will for salvation, okay? Second, the missions, the sending of the Son and Spirit, are God's Trinitarian accomplishment of that will to salvation. And third, those very missions, those very sendings of Son and Spirit are the very things which, by which God reveals himself as eternally triune. How do we know that God is Trinity? Because he sent Jesus, he sent the Spirit, and we have that. God has bound up your election and your salvation by grace alone in his very Trinitarian life. God will not let his holy name of Father, Son, and Spirit, and thus his holy and perfect and wise, loving decision to create you and to be your God, he won't let that be thwarted by the creature's rebellion. He will be seen as wise and perfectly good and perfectly just and perfectly glorious. And why did God choose Israel? It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, God says in Deuteronomy 7. But it is because the Lord loves you that he loves you. And according to Ezekiel 36, God alone will accomplish this fellowship restoring work so that, quote, you will know that I am the Lord, he does this. He saves us, quote, for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. So you can have hope in the face of death. You can trust that your salvation is sure by grace alone, and you can look at death that looks like a very big valley full of very dry, very dead bones because the Lord cares for his name and he cares for you in Jesus Christ. God will do these things. God will save you, his creature, by grace alone, apart from any merit of yours, because he is the one who he always is, the one perfect God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life. So be at peace.